section twenty three of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various the end of all by nim crinkle part one the difficulty that i experience in complying with your request dear spirit springs from the terrestrial limitations of thought and expression from which as you may well know i have not been long enough with you to free myself i shall however give you a plain narrative of the events attending the extinction of life on our planet asking you only to remember that i am doing it just as i would have done it were it possible for a fellow human being while on earth using the phraseology and the terrestrial time divisions with which i am most familiar the circumstance which at our last intercourse i was trying to explain to you was simply this in the early summer of the year eighteen hundred ninety two a sudden interruption of navigation occurred on the pacific coast which curiously enough attracted very little attention outside of scientific circles i was living at the house of my wealthy friend judge brisbane in gramercy park to tell you the truth i was in love with his beautiful daughter of whom i shall have to speak more fully to you for she was intimately associated with me in the appalling scenes which you desire me to describe i was sitting in the judge's library on the night of june twenty fifth his daughter was present and i had been conversing with her in an undertone while the judge read the evening papers he suddenly laid down the paper took off his spectacles and turning round in his chair said to me did you see the brief dispatch in the morning papers two days ago from san francisco saying that all the eastern bound vessels were overdue on that coast i replied at once that i had not noticed it it is astonishing he said that in our present system of journalism the most important events connected with the welfare of mankind receive the slightest attention from the newspapers and the trivialities of life are most voluminously treated a movement in the iron trade that affects millions of homes gets a brief paragraph in small type and the quarrel of a ballet girl with her paramour receives illuminated attention down whole columns here is something taking place in the pacific ocean of surpassing interest to the race and nobody pays the slightest attention to it except perhaps the consignees and shipping clerks what is it we both asked with the languid interest that young people having an overmastering personal affair on hand would be apt to take in matters of national or universal importance the judge got up and going to a side table where he kept his papers piled in chronological order pulled out a recent issue of a morning journal and after looking it over searchingly a moment said here i should think you would notice such a paragraph as this then he read as i recollect a telegraphic dispatch to this effect san francisco june twenty third considerable anxiety is felt here in commercial circles by the non-arrival of any eastward-bound vessels for a week the steamship cafe of the occidental line is overdue four days an unusual easterly wind has been blowing for twenty-four hours weather mild that dispatch you will perceive said the judge was sent two days ago now here on the twenty fifth i read in the evening paper another dispatch from san francisco hidden away at the bottom of column of commercial news listen to this san francisco june twenty fifth the entire suspension of travel from the west continues to excite the gravest apprehensions nothing but coastwise vessels have come in during the past eight days 
the u s cruiser mobile left honolulu three weeks ago for this coast there is no official intimation of a storm in the chinese seas the judge laid the paper down and regarded us both a moment in silence as if expecting to hear some remark that indicated our suddenly awakened curiosity i don't think we responded with any adequate interest to the occasion miss brisbane did indeed stare at her father in her dreamy abstracted way a moment and then got up and going to the open window began to arrange the curtains as if relinquishing whatever problem there was to the superior acumen of the masculine mind i think i said that it looked as if there had been a cyclone somewhere and if there had we should in all probability get the accounts of it soon enough but young man replied the judge with his magisterial emphasis cyclones do not extend from the fiftieth degree of north latitude to the fortieth degree of south latitude and vessels are due at san francisco from melbourne and japan what then other than a storm at sea could have caused a detention of all these vessels i asked and i must have unwittingly betrayed in the tone of my voice or the expression of my face that considerate superciliousness with which youth regards the serious notions of mature philosophers for the judge putting his gold spectacles upon his nose and regarding me over the top of them a moment said rather severely other than the known and regular phenomena of this planet do not interest young men if i could answer your question there would be no special interest in the matter i mention these trivial incidents because insignificant as they may seem they were the first ripples of that disaster which was soon enough to overwhelm us all and to show you what were the only premonitions the world had of the events which were to follow on june twenty sixth the subject did not occur to me a hundred other things of far more immediate consequence to me occupied my attention a young man who is preparing to get married is not apt to take sombre views of anything nor is he very apt to allow the contumacy of age in his prospective father-in-law to aggravate him it was a pardonable freak i thought in a man who had retired in most respects from the active world to dogmatize a little about that world now that he judged it through his favourite evening paper when therefore on the night of the twenty sixth while at the tea-table the judge broke out again about the meteorological wave on the pacific coast his daughter kate and i exchanged a rapid but furtive glance which said in the perfect understanding of lovers there comes the old gentleman's new hobby again and we can well afford to treat it leniently the judge had the damp evening paper in his hand and he disregarded the steaming cup of tea which his daughter had poured for him well he said with a toss of self-satisfied import now the newspapers are waking up to the significance of the california news he then read from the paper as nearly as i can recollect something like the following san francisco june twenty sixth there is an intense and growing anxiety on this coast with respect to the non-appearance of any eastward-bound vessels the breeze from the east continues and is unprecedented now i should like to know said the judge as he laid down the paper and took up his teacup why a breeze from the east in california should be unprecedented because i ventured to remark it usually blows from the sea at this season nonsense exclaimed the judge with vigour a variation for a few days in wind or weather is a common occurrence everywhere fancy a message sent to all over the world from the west indies that the trade winds were six days late or a telegram from minnesota that the winter frosts had been interfered with for a week by pleasant sunshine no sir the event of importance to the californian at this moment is the mysterious something that has happened out at sea and there is no excuse for his associating a summer breeze from the east with it except that there is something peculiar about that breeze that associates it in the mind with the predominant mystery 
i smiled you will pardon me judge but it seems to me i said that you are trying to invest the whole affair with an occult significance that is subjective i suppose that in a few hours the matter will be explained and forgotten in a moment we were in one of those foolish little wrangles in which so far as argument is concerned the younger man is at a great disadvantage when the elder however unreasonable his claims enforces them with the advantage of age and position i remember that the desire to convince kate on the one hand that i was free from what i conceived to be her father's unreasonableness and sustain my independence of views on the other hand led me to say much more than was polite for i exasperated the old gentleman and with a curt and not altogether complimentary remark he got up and left the room the moment he was gone i turned to the daughter and laughingly said well my dear i am afraid i have offended your father without intending it but you at least understand me and are free from his superstition to my surprise she regarded me with a serious air and replied i do not know what you mean by superstition my father believes that something has happened and i feel that he is right you do not mean to tell me i said that you believe anything has happened that can concern us she made no reply i looked at her with some astonishment and wondered if i had offended her by opposing her father's childish views perhaps i persisted you too think i am stupidly unreasonable because i will not consent to be dishonestly chimerical i well remember the look of sad reproach with which she silently regarded me and i well remember too the thought that came into my mind i said to myself this is the same obduracy that her father has shown odd it is that i never noticed the trait in her before then i added with an equal obduracy that i was not conscious of perhaps you too have discovered some peculiarity of good sense in me that is offensive and you are afraid that something will happen if we here she interrupted me in her quiet resolute and reproachful way something has happened she said i was amazed if i had suddenly discovered that the woman i loved was unfaithful to me it could not have produced in my frame of mind at that moment a greater shock it seemed to me then that the wooing of months the confidence and affection of a year were to be sacrificed in a moment of infatuated stubbornness the very thought was so unnatural that it produced a revulsion in my own feelings my darling i said as i went toward her impulsively we are playing the unworthy part of fools nothing can ever happen that will make us love each other less or prevent you from being my wife i put my arm around her in the old familiar way she was passive and irresponsive she stood there limply holding the curtain with one white arm upraised her beautiful head bent over and her eyes cast down so that i could not look into her face this stony obduracy was so new and unlike her that i withdrew my arm and stepped back a little to regard her with astonishment not unmingled with pique at that moment she lifted her head slowly and as she looked at me with a dreamy and faraway pathos i saw that her eyes were filled with tears it seems to me she said with a voice that sounded as if it was addressed to an invisible phantom way beyond me it seems to me that i shall never be your wife i must have stared at her several seconds in silence then i said you are ill you are not yourself when you have recovered your normal condition i will come back i snatched a kiss from her lips that were strangely cold and rushed from the house end of section twenty three section twenty four 
of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Eleven Possible Cases by Various. The End of All by Nim Crinkle. Part Two. It was not till the next morning, when I woke up after a short and disturbed sleep, that my mind reverted to the cause of all this purely sentimental disagreement and i felt a strong desire to have events prove that the judge was slightly monomaniacal and that i was right i went to riccadonna's for my breakfast and got all the morning papers as usual but this time with a distinct confidence that the news would be the best vindication of my good sense and that i should yet have a good laugh at the judge i opened the paper as i sipped my coffee and the first thing my eyes fell on were the headlines of a dispatch from st louis i read them with an inexplicable sense of something sinking in me as i recall them they ran as follows strange news from the west all communication west of salt lake city ceases meteorological puzzle what is the matter with the wires then followed the dispatch which i have not forgotten st louis june twenty sixth eight p m a dispatch received here from yuma on the texas pacific announces that no eastern bound train has come in since morning and all attempts to open communication by telegraph with points west of that place have failed it is the opinion of railroad men that a great storm is raging in california weather here pleasant with a steady dry wind from the east blowing immediately following this was another news item which i can quote from memory denver june twenty sixth nine p m intelligence from cheyenne is to the effect that railway travel and telegraphic communication west of pocatello on the union pacific and ogden and on the central pacific have been interrupted by a storm the telegraph wires are believed to be in good condition but up to nine o'clock there has been no return current i read these paragraphs over three or four times ordinarily i should have passed them by and given my attention to other and more congenial news but now a dull fear that events were conspiring to widen the breach between myself and the brisbanes focused my interest on them there was that easterly wind blowing again was i too growing superstitious i turned over all the papers the news was the same in all but there was not an editorial paragraph of comment in any of the sheets which indeed teemed with all the details of active commercial political and social life i went down town after eating my breakfast and found that the intelligence had not awakened any public attention that was observable the two or three persons to whom i spoke with regard to it treated it as one of the passing sensations of the hour that would be explained sooner or later it was not till the evening papers of the twenty seventh came out that the matter began to be discussed the dispatches in these papers were of a nature to arouse widespread anxiety it was very obvious from their construction and import that the feeling west of the mississippi was more intense than had up to this time been suspected the columns of the papers were filled with brief but rather startling telegrams from various points denver el paso salt lake city cheyenne st paul st louis and chicago sent anxious sentences which had a thrill of trepidation in their broken phrases and it was easy to see that this feeling of deep concern increased with each dispatch from a point further west 
telegrams sent to st louis chicago and st paul represented the condition of anxiety in ogden and pocatello to be bordering on excitement fears were entertained the dispatches said of a meteorological cataclysm and thousands who had friends either on the coast or in transit were besieging the telegraph offices in vain the hurried comments of the evening papers on the news were singularly unsatisfactory and non-committal the unprecedented storm that is now raging on the pacific slope i read and which has temporarily cut off communications with the far west will by its magnitude fill the country with the most serious apprehensions the earliest news from california which shall give us the details of the storm said another paper will be looked for with eagerness and will be promptly and fully furnished to our readers as curious as anybody could be to know what kind of a storm it was that had stopped railroad travel from idaho to mexico and remarking with surprise that the signal office utterly refused to recognize a great storm anywhere i dismissed the subject from my mind with the reflection that there would in all probability be explanatory news in the morning and resolved to make my usual visit to the brisbane family to my surprise kate received me cordially and with no other allusion to the unpleasantness of the night before than a demure remark that she was afraid she had offended me let us not refer to it at all i said and thus avoid making idiots of ourselves i am glad you came to-night she remarked after a moment's silence for i wanted to tell you of the change we are going to make a little pang darted through me it was said so seriously what is it my dear i asked trying to be as affectionate as if the conditions had not changed my father and i have determined to go to europe to europe i repeated aghast you surely do not mean it yes resolutely he wanted to consult you about it but was afraid you would disagree with his plans and when did he make up his mind to take this sudden move this morning and you intend to go with him yes and i was going to ask you to go too when do you propose to go immediately it was evident to my mind now that this old man was a panic-stricken monomaniac and had infected his daughter with his fears kate i said as i took her by her hands and pulled her to the sofa beside me you are running away from something it is not from me is it i want you to go with us she answered but you knew when you asked me that i could not go so suddenly you expected me to refuse no she said i expect you to consent be careful in a moment of bravado i may take you at your word at any cost she caught hold of me do she said tremulously and i felt a little shiver in her hand do do i would rather go with you than lose you i said at a hazard and if you are determined to go i believe i will accompany you if your father will consent we are determined she calmly replied but i must put my affairs in order i suggested how many hours will it take you hours i repeated you would not like to start to-night surely yes she answered i would gladly start to-night my patience was giving way very fast at this imperturbable obduracy perhaps i said you will give me some adequate reason for a haste that i cannot comprehend she did not answer she was listening with her head averted and she held up her hand for me to listen also as if that were her answer then there came through the open window the hoarse cry of a distant newsboy who was bellowing an extra there was something weird in her attitude and action connecting as they did her motives with that discordant ominous cry it's an extra i said 
as unconcernedly as possible i'll get a copy there may be some good news for you and i made a move toward the window don't she said quietly we were talking about going to europe pa's not familiar with the business of securing passages and you are you could relieve him of a great deal of worry and if you would go with us kate i said do you want me to go yes i do she replied i do not want to leave you here then i said i will go i will see your father in the morning and tell him that i will attend to the whole business of securing passages i will set about arranging my affairs at once she then let me plague her a little about her timidity and after a half hour of playful badinage on my part i came away with a parting promise on my lips to lose no delay in making the arrangements for our departure such however was not my intention i felt sure that the judge and his daughter would change their minds if i could only manage to delay matters a few days to go running off to europe at a moment's notice would be utter folly for me as i left the house i heard the voices of the newsboys in various keys still calling the extras i bought a paper and read it under the gaslight of the church on twentieth street display headlines announced as silent as the grave nothing heard from the pacific great excitement in chicago and st louis i must have stood there ten minutes poring over the strange news an expedition in a special train had been sent west from yuma that day with railroad men and doctors it had left at three p m the train reached mesquite in less than an hour and word was sent back from that station all right here track clear we'll reach the springs at nine p m a dispatch from yuma sent at ten o'clock and received at st louis said nothing further heard from the special news from chicago where the excitement appeared to be momentarily growing reflected intelligence from denver st paul and kansas city and it was vain to ignore the fact that the entire west was in an alarming condition of anxiety a special train was fitting out at cheyenne under government orders to start in the morning with a corps of signal service men army officers and electricians it was to go provided with every scientific appliance and to carry an insulated cable to be paid out from the car the account said that the people were all on the streets in cheyenne and an enormous mob surrounded the station where the preparations were making for the first time i felt as i threw the paper away what i can only call a sense of misgiving as i walked up the deserted avenue this feeling grew upon me and when i reached twenty-third street on my way to the fifth avenue hotel a sudden and entirely new reflection made me stop unconsciously as i turned it over in my mind if this strange news has affected judge brisbane and his daughter so seriously why may it not be affecting millions of other people similarly if there is at this moment a panic in the west how long will it take the reflex wave to reach new york the next morning events or at least the publication of them had reached that condition which arrests public attention everywhere the news from the west swamped all else in the morning journals the editors by their work now acknowledged that the mysterious silence on the pacific slope was by far the most important subject for consideration before the world the moment i glanced at the sheets i saw that there was but one theme in the journalistic mind two days had passed and the silence was unbroken never before in the history of the world had the absence of news become such important news public attention was now mainly centred on the attempt to get a train of observation through from cheyenne there was a hopeful spirit to most of the accounts as if it was believed that science would unravel the mystery 
but there was nothing from any quarter of the globe that as yet afforded the feeblest gleam of comfort the government train was to start early on this the morning of the twenty eighth and the papers were only able to furnish details of the preparation and reports of the public excitement in cheyenne and denver the officers on the train were to send dispatches from every station west of pocatello they were sagacious experienced men and the expedition was under the direction of the well-known engineer general albert corral i felt as i read the accounts that these men would probably clear up the mystery and i resolved to delay engaging the passages on the ocean steamer until the next day so i wrote a carefully worded note to judge brisbane informing him that i would attend to the matter immediately had i then had the slightest knowledge of the cumulative rapidity with which a panic moves i would not have taken this risk but my whole object was to gain time with the hope that something would occur to change the minds of my two timid friends end of section twenty four section twenty five of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various the end of all by nim crinkle part three on the night of the twenty eighth i avoided the brisbane establishment although my desire drew me in that direction i resolved to wait until the morrow and if nothing happened to change the determination of the judge to go to europe to then make my arrangements to go with him and kate that night there was a visible change in the metropolis the theatres were deserted men and women were congregated at the corners and were walking in the roadways a sure indication in a great city of some popular disturbance the bulletins and news centres were crowded and the mystery of the great silence was being discussed by everybody one thing struck everybody with a vague terror and it was the accounts of the strange wind that was now blowing at cheyenne and denver one special correspondent at cheyenne said that it seemed to him that the atmosphere of the earth influenced by some incomprehensible suction was all rushing to an unseen vortex it was not in any sense a disturbance of the atmosphere that we usually call a wind but a steady silent draught and the spectacle of trees bent over and held all day by the pressure but unfluttered and unrelieved by fluctuant variations filled them with wonder and dread i got up early on the morning of the twenty ninth for i had slept lightly and fitfully to my surprise i found that almost everybody else was up it made me realize as i had not done before the feverish tension of public expectation the news if news it can be called was startling let me try and repeat it to you just as it was presented to my sense the special train upon which the eyes of the whole country were fixed had been heard from it had gone west from cheyenne and passed through pocatello without interruption then followed the dispatches received from it at cheyenne as it passed the stations beyond pocatello they were in this order and to this effect missiono ten a m all right instruments working well track clear inhabitants appear to be moving east no intelligence of a definite character obtained shoshone one hundred eight miles west expect to make it in four hours bannock two thirty p m conditions unchanged past moving settlers all the way they are going east with chattels wind from the east has the pressure without the violence of a gale party in good spirits 
sunshine three fifteen vast herds of wild cattle now impeding progress wind increasing road otherwise clear american falls four forty signs of the exodus decreasing country strewn with household goods reports here that all the teams that went out on the roads west have not returned expect to hear something definite from minidoka minidoka six ten electrical and barometrical indications unchanged signs of life disappearing party in excellent spirits and eager to reach the facts the next dispatch was from cheyenne and was sent at eight o'clock it simply said nothing further heard from government party wire in good order then followed two telegrams of gruesome brevity and significance pocatello nine p m nothing here cheyenne ten p m nothing has come over the special wire up to this hour microphonic tests at pocatello indicate that the train is still moving electrical tests indicate that the current is unbroken finally there was a special message from the new york stars correspondent at cheyenne dated eleven p m it was about to this effect the current on the government wire was broken at ten forty delicate tests show that the wire is now grounded the dire conclusion of experts here is that the train ran from some point west of minidoka from about six fifteen to ten forty without human control and then met with an accident at the rate at which it was moving the train must have reached shoshone terrible excitement here my keen sense detected in the newspaper itself certain infallible little signs that the news had disturbed the precision and routine of the office lines of type were in the wrong place and typographical errors made it difficult to get the exact sense dispatch after dispatch all bearing the same import of panic was huddled into the column from st louis the announcement was an unprecedented excitement here over the news from cheyenne the authorities appear to have lost their heads and are unable to preserve order eastward bound trains are carrying away people at a mob rate we are in the midst of chaos from chicago the intelligence was similarly appalling a panic prevails here said the dispatch impelled by a senseless apprehension of disaster people have lost their reason the mayor has just issued a call upon the best citizens to assist him in preserving order it required no news expert to see that all the issues of life were temporarily suspended by the tremendous and growing interest in the stupendous mystery channels of news worn smooth by the placid streams of everyday platitudes began to show the role of this new freshet a dispatch from washington was unintentionally significant it read like this the only explanation forwarded by colonel sandford of the abandonment of the pike's peak signal station by himself and party is that of a coward he says the wind pressure indicated that the place would speedily become untenable i turned over the sheet in which these disheartening facts were presented and looked at the editorial page there was a double-leaded leader evidently written late at night and its conclusions were more gruesome than the facts for while the facts could be interpreted in various ways according to the reader's condition of mind there was no mistaking the official tone of the editor whose business it was to weigh and estimate the public value of news it seemed to me that this umpire to whom we instinctively looked for opinions had thrown up the sponge so to speak let me recall his words as they were impressed upon me that morning that a grave crisis has arrived in the conditions of life on this planet it would be folly and is impossible any longer to deny it is not our province nor is it within our power to offer any solution of the stupendous mystery that is now enveloping a part of our continent 
it is only imperative upon us as brave agents in the dispensing of truth to say with all the candor that we can summon that the effort of the government to open communication with the vast region west of what must now be known as the meridian of silence has dismally failed and it is the conviction of the maturest judgment based upon all the facts of the attempt that are obtainable that it failed because the explorers themselves ceased to exist when they had passed a certain pretty well-defined line which we now know extends north and south from helena in montana to yuma on the borders of mexico i found myself standing by my breakfast table reading this i had risen unconsciously my breakfast was unheeded an ungovernable impulse to go anywhere seized me to sit still with this crushing uncertainty was impossible i found myself in a coupe where i got it i do not distinctly remember but i do remember that it was by means of an extraordinary offer to the driver who like all his fellows was dashing through the streets at a headlong pace and i also have a very clear recollection of the strange nervous effect produced upon me by seeing the people along the curbs on broadway watching the flying vehicles with a mute terror as if the very recklessness of the drivers afforded them a palpable distraction from the unintelligible weight of their own fears i speedily noticed that the stream of humanity on the streets was tending downtown and almost immediately i understood that it was heading like myself for the news centres i could get no farther than chambers street owing to the block of people and vehicles and the driver rudely refused to take the risk of a jam i looked at the city hall clock it was only eight my heart was beating rapidly and i knew enough of the effect of emotion on the cardiac system to understand that it was caused by suspense a thousand new terrors were in the air of which the experience and the sagacity of man were ignorant i forced my way with the greatest difficulty across the park which was full of restless but strangely mute people and got near enough to the newspaper bulletins to read the painted lines they were feverishly indicative of the cross currents of excitement in the country and were in short decisive sentences like this the president asked to appoint a day of humiliation and prayer immediately the governor of colorado crazed by the excitement commits suicide mob rule in chicago rioting in denver breakdown of the alton and chicago road unparalleled scenes at el paso fanaticism in new orleans the christian pastors of this city will meet at cooper union at ten o'clock irrespective of sect panic in milwaukee held by a numbing sort of fascination i read these sentences over and over across printing-house square on another bulletin in big black letters i saw the line it baffles the world has annihilation set in there was something weird in the use of the pronoun it it seemed to be man's last effort in language to express a mystery that was specific and yet incomprehensible and i found that by the common consent of ignorance men were referring to the phenomenon as it i looked at the strained anxious faces of the mob and a great fear fell upon me with it came an awful reproach i would go instantly and redeem my word to kate by securing passages to europe i had to fight my way by inches out of the stolid and frightened crowd to the steamship office on lower broadway and there i found another jam the street was full of private carriages and it was impossible to get anywhere near the entrance to the office i saw a policeman who was on the outside of the press and who was walking up and down in a restless and unofficial manner what is the matter here i asked him he looked me all over as if he suspected that i had fallen out of the clouds then he said trying to get tickets for europe where do you come from and then after a restless turn or two he added as he passed me 
but it ain't no use cause there ain't steamships enough in the world end of section twenty five section twenty six of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various the end of all by nim crinkle part four then it was i think that the whole terrible truth first lit my consciousness like the sudden upflaring of a bale fire the inhabitants were fleeing from the country they were all affected as had been the brisbanes i was the only dolt and idiot and liar who had no instincts of danger and who had failed to rescue the woman i loved when she had appealed to me then i plunged wildly out into the street with a feeling of desperation and that sinking of the spirits that comes only in the worst crises and when one begins to comprehend how helpless man is i saw that in the brief time that had elapsed a change had taken place in the aspect of the crowds when i got to broadway again it was with the utmost difficulty that i could make my way at all against the surging mass of people that seemed momentarily to swell it was utterly unlike any crowd in numbers and disposition that i had ever encountered it was made up of all classes it had lost that american characteristic of good humour which had been swallowed up in a dire personal and selfish instinct of self-preservation it was animated by a vague terror and disregarded every consideration but that of personal safety a horrible conviction seized me that the ordinary restraints of society were breaking down and that speedily panic would mount to chaos i saw that this dread was adding to the terror of everybody aside from the fear of it like an assemblage in a burning building the fear of each other was more subtle and operative than the fear of the elements by indefatigable labour i got off the main thoroughfare and reached hudson street and here in the crowd i learned the latest news and discovered the cause of the rapidly increasing excitement i had run against an intimate friend and associate by accident his first words were as he wiped the perspiration out of his eyes well this is awful eh what's the news i asked the latest is that the death line has moved the thurbers have a private wire and i just heard that denver is cut off now it looks as if it was every man for himself so terrible was this announcement and so engrossed was i with the despairing thoughts that it gave rise to that i took little heed of what was going on about me until i reached canal street the one dull conviction that it was useless to fight against now was that annihilation had set in that some destroying wave had started out to encircle the globe and that the race was doomed something god alone knew what had happened to our planet and humanity was to be swept away in one of those cataclysms with which soulless nature prepares for a new order of existence i was rudely awakened from this reverie of wretchedness by the crowd which surged against me with a blind unvindictive violence my one desire was to get uptown to the woman i loved and had neglected and i saw that every minute was adding to the difficulty how i reached the brefort house i do not know but there i found a number of citizens who had not utterly lost their heads and who had come together for counsel there was a private wire in the house and they were receiving intelligence from several central points in the city the looks of these men who were huddled into the parlour were enough to dismay the most resolute observer 
their pale faces and painfully set mouths indicated the sense of an awful crisis which wisdom did not know how to meet or avoid a well-known citizen read the dispatches to them as they were received and torn as i was by impatience my curiosity held me there to hear it was now about half-past eleven in the morning the rapidity with which events had moved since i got up was made startling apparent by the information here furnished the authorities together with a number of influential citizens had come together as if by a common instinct at the fifth avenue hotel the mayor the police and fire commissioners several wealthy bankers and a number of prominent clergymen were holding some kind of council and sending out appeals for cooperation and addresses to the public which latter were entirely unheeded as i forced myself into the room i saw and heard a venerable and majestic gentleman evidently a clergyman addressing those present in an impassioned manner there were tears in his eyes and an awful sadness in his voice men and brethren he said it is appointed unto all men once to die if it be appointed unto us who remain to die together let us die like christians who still retain our faith in eternal justice and eternal mercy and not like wild beasts that devour each other a report came that the fatal east wind was blowing and at this there was a general movement of those present as if the time were too short to waste in longer listening i came up lafayette place to astor place with the intention of reaching fourth avenue both spaces were choked with people and on eighth street i saw a woman on the steps of a private residence wildly calling on the mob which paid no attention to her to repent for the day of judgment was at hand her white hair was blown over her face and her arms were frantically gesticulating into the great hall of the cooper union a mass of religious people had flocked and a number of speakers who were making addresses and offering up prayers when i passed the woman who was exhorting the crowd i had noticed the manner in which her hair which was of soft flossy white streamed out straight in front of her but it did not occur to me until i reached the square in front of the cooper union that this was caused by the peculiar and ominous draught of wind from the east of which i had heard so much for it was there that i saw a crowd pointing up to the roof of the vast building known as the bible house which appeared to be covered with people some of them were holding flags and drapery and the material floated out westward without any of the undulating motion which always marks a flag in a disturbed current these extemporized pennants stood out as if they were starched i could see that this sign produced a dumb sort of terror in the crowd it seemed to me then that all emotion of which i was capable was centred in the one desire to get to the woman i loved and die with her a crushing and at the same time an animating remorse as if somehow i had been responsible for her death at least in disregarding her warnings and somehow doubly guilty in mistrusting her motives unmanned me and inflamed me it was with something of the same disregard of everybody but one's self that i had seen in others that i fought my way to twenty-first street what brutalities i committed need not be recounted that hour remains with me an acute and jangled memory of frenzy i reached the steps of judge brisbane's house torn and bleeding the terrible scenes were in my eyes and the dreadful monotonous tumult of human desperation that vast sigh of doomed humanity pierced here and there by the wails and shrieks of despair and the cries of innocence for help was in my ears the celerity with which it had all come on left no chance for cool reason an invisible phantom was at the heels of the community and we were part of a mighty stampede after fumbling for an instant at the bell and pushing back several ghastly creatures who were on the steps 
i must have applied my shoulder to the door and pushed it in someone appeared to be resisting on the other side but it gave way and i half fell into judge brisbane's vestibule an instant later we were looking into each other's faces i bloodied and soiled and ragged and wild with the frenzy of fear and impatience he pale as death but resolute and holding an enormous bar over me quick he said help me fasten this door that sudden call of duty struck something habitual in me and without knowing exactly what i was doing i found myself assisting him in barricading the door the endeavour somewhat changed the current of my thoughts from the danger that was unseen to the danger that was storming under our windows i must have muttered some kind of excuse for my conduct to the judge for he said no time for apologies or recriminations now the house is full of my neighbours who have come here for protection go upstairs and look after the women the best and only thing we can do is to preserve a quiet place to die in and not be trampled to pieces are you armed i dashed up the broad staircase and found the upper rooms occupied by women some of whom in mourning attire hastily thrown on were sitting around with their heads in their hands while others were huddled at the windows staring with strained looks of terror at the crowds on the street walking up and down the room wringing his hands a middle-aged man was giving expression to the most terrible irony and cowardice without reference to his listeners i ran my eye over the huddled groups of frightened women the one i sought was not there i flew through the groaning figures on the stairway up to her chamber i knocked loudly and called her by name passionately then i listened i heard nothing but the dull sounds of the human tumult that came through the open casement and the sighing tones of the telegraph wires as a steady draught from the east swept through them i shook the door and abjured her to come to me then in my madness i burst it in she was on her knees at the bed with her hands on her ears and her head buried in the bedclothes i fell down on my knees beside her and put my arm around her kate i said we will die together look up love at least is eternal she was cold i caught her head between my hands and turned her beautiful face toward me my god she was dead dead with her staring eyes full of terror and her beautiful mouth set in hard and ghastly lines then it was that i felt rise up within me for the first time the rebellious bitterness of the natural man need i tell you that at such moments man is little better than an animal save in his free agency that enables him to defy i passed hours there moaning cursing bewailing when at last the force of the paroxysm had expended itself i shook my fist in the face of heaven with the obduracy of pagan greek and said come on now you envious fates and do your worst speedily or i will be too quick for you judge brisbane found me there raving do you know i asked yes he answered and i'm grateful she has spared much that we must endure and so i said life love and the vaunted future of the race end in mockery it seems so he replied but we cannot be sure come with me we ascended to the roof the spectacle that greeted us was indescribable the tops of all the houses were black with people who were staring mutely and with childish terror into the west the steady subdued organ tone of the rushing atmosphere could now be heard above all else we stood there in silence a few moments and then i said it's terrible what do you suppose is taking place i suppose replied the judge that we are losing our atmosphere reeling it off so to speak slowly as we revolve 
our planet has entered some portion of the ethereal space where the conditions are sucking us dry of oxygen as it recedes from the earth the water disappears and we shall be left to revolve like the moon without air and without liquid and consequently without life he said this meditatively less as if he were answering my question than if he were formulating his own fears then i remarked if this takes place gradually the millions have got to struggle and writhe and fight together in suffocation we can at least blow our brains out and cheat such a fate i should hate said the judge to think that the man who was to marry kate had not the bravery to face his destiny that was all that was said we came down and some ripples of intelligence reached us during the afternoon from one or two persons who made their way into the house we learned that in the frenzy of fear the populace were committing the most extraordinary excesses the shoreline of the atlantic was crowded with people many of whom plunged into the ocean in the vain attempt to get away the scenes in the city were too revolting to narrate for a large class of the community released from all restraint of moral and civil law were bent on securing all the lawless pleasures that force could command during the few hours that was left to them and the line was steadily coming east chicago was cut off at twelve o'clock and at four intelligence had ceased coming from buffalo at this time the sound of the winds was like the roar of the sea i had torn myself away from the window where i had been staring at the now packed and struggling masses of people and had locked myself in the room with the dead body of kate there was a vial of opium on her table that had been used for neuralgia i swallowed it and sat down by the bedside i know not how long i remained there but a loud report as of a discharged cannon roused me i remember staggering and panting in the dark with a semi-consciousness that the end had come and i now know that report was occasioned by the bursting of the drums of my ears i remember nothing more i have given you a plain statement of my experiences in that crisis and i dare say they are uneventful enough by the side of the experiences of millions. End of section twenty six. Section twenty seven of Eleven Possible Cases by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Shall he marry her? by anna catherine green chapter one when i met taylor at the club the other night he looked so cheerful i scarcely knew him what is it cried i advancing with outstretched hand i am going to be married was his gay reply this is my last night at the club i was glad and showed it taylor is a man for whom domestic life is a necessity he has never been at home with us though we all liked him and he in his way liked us and who is the fortunate lady i inquired for i had been out of town for some time and had not as yet been made acquainted with the latest society news my intended bride is mrs walworth the young widow he must have seen a change take place in my expression for he stopped you know her of course he added after a short study of my face i had by this time regained my self-possession of course i repeated and i have always thought her one of the most attractive women in town another shake upon it old man but my heart was heavy and my mind perplexed notwithstanding the forced cordiality of my tones and i took an early opportunity to withdraw by myself and think over the situation mrs walworth 
She was a pretty woman, and what was more, she was to all appearance a woman whose winning manners bespoke a kindly heart. Just the person, I contemplated, whom I would pick out for the helpmate of my somewhat exacting friend if... I paused on that if. It was a formidable one, and grew none the smaller or less important under my broodings. Indeed, it seemed to dilate until it assumed gigantic proportions, worrying me and weighing so heavily upon my conscience that I at last rose from the newspaper at which I had been hopelessly staring, and looking up Taylor again, asked him how soon he expected to become a Benedict. His answer startled me. In a week, he replied, and if I have not asked you to the ceremony, it is because Helen is not in a position to... I suppose he finished the sentence, but I did not hear him. If the marriage was so near, of course it would be folly on my part to attempt to hinder it. I drew off for the second time. But I could not remain easy. Taylor is a good fellow, and it would be a shame to allow him to marry a woman with whom he could never be happy. He would feel any such disappointment so keenly, so much more keenly than most men. A lack of principle or even a sensibility on her part would make him miserable. Anticipating heaven, it would not take a hell to make him wretched. A purgatory would do it. Was I right, then, in letting him proceed in his intentions regarding Mrs. Woolworth, when she possibly was the woman who... I paused and tried to call up her countenance before me. It was a sweet one, and possibly a true one. I might have trusted her for myself but I do not look for perfection, and Taylor does, and will certainly go to the bad if he is deceived in his expectations. But in a week? It is too late for interference, only it is never too late till the knot is tied. As I thought of this, I decided impulsively, and perhaps, you may say, unwisely, to give him a hint of his danger, and I did it in this wise. Taylor said I when I had him safely in my own rooms. I'm going to tell you a bit of personal history, curious enough, I think, to interest you even upon the eve of your marriage. I do not know when I shall see you again, and I should like you to know how a lawyer and a man of the world can sometimes be taken in. He nodded, accepting the situation good-humouredly, though I saw by the abstraction with which he gazed into the fire that I should have to be very interesting to lure him from the thoughts that engrossed him. As I meant to be very interesting, this did not greatly concern me. One morning last spring, I began, I received in my morning mail a letter, the delicate penmanship of which at once attracted my attention and awakened my curiosity. Turning to the signature, I read the name of a young lady friend of mine, and, somewhat startled at the thought that this was the first time I had ever seen the handwriting of one I knew so well, I perused the letter with an interest that presently became painful as I realized the tenor of its contents. I will not quote the letter, though I could, but confine myself to saying that after a modest recognition of my friendship for her, quite a fatherly friendship, I assure you, as she's only eighteen and I, as you know, am well on toward fifty, she proceeded to ask in a humble and confiding spirit for the loan, do not start, of fifty dollars. Such a request coming from a young girl, well-connected and with every visible sign of being generously provided for by her father, was certainly startling to an old bachelor of settled ways and strict notions, but remembering her youth and the childish innocence of her manner, I turned over the page and read as her reason for proffering such a request that her heart was set upon aiding a certain poor family 
that stood in immediate need of food, clothes, and medicines, but that she could not do what she wished because she had already spent all the money allowed her by her father for such purposes, and dared not go to him for more, as she had once before offended him by doing this, and feared if she repeated her fault he would carry out the threat he had then made of stopping her allowance altogether. But the family was a deserving one, and she could not see any member of it starve. So she came to me, of whose goodness she was assured, convinced I would understand her perplexity and excuse her, and so forth and so forth, in language quite childlike and entreating, which, if it did not satisfy my ideas of propriety, at least touched my heart, and made any action which I could take in the matter extremely difficult. To refuse her request would be at once to mortify and aggrieve her. To accede to it and give her the fifty dollars she asked, a sum by the way I could not well spare, would be to encourage an action easily pardoned once, but which if repeated would lead to unpleasant complications, to say the least. The third course of informing her father of what she needed I did not even consider, for I knew him well enough to be sure that nothing but pain to her would be the result. I therefore compromised the affair by enclosing the money in a letter in which I told her that I comprehended her difficulties, and sent with pleasure the amount she needed, but that, as a friend, I must add that, while in the present instance she had run no risk of being misunderstood or unkindly censured, that such a request made to another man and under other circumstances might provoke a surprise capable of leading to the most unpleasant consequences, and advised her, if she ever again found herself in such a strait, to appeal directly to her father, or else to deny herself a charity which she was in no position to bestow. This letter I undertook to deliver myself, for one of the curious points of her communication had been the entreaty that I would not delay the help she needed by trusting the money to any hand but my own, but would bring it to a certain hotel downtown and place it at the beginning of the book of Isaiah, in the large Bible I would find lying on a side table in the small parlor of the main one. She would seek it there before the morning was over, and so, without the intervention of a third party, acquire the means she desired for helping a poor and deserving family. I knew the hotel she mentioned, and I remembered the room, but I did not remember the Bible. However, it was sure to be in the place she indicated, and though I was not in much sympathy with my errand, I respected her whim and carried the letter downtown. I had reached Main Street and was in sight of the hotel designated, when suddenly, on an opposite corner of the street, I saw the young girl herself. She looked as fresh as the morning, and smiled so gaily, I felt somewhat repaid for the annoyance she had caused me and, gratified that I could cut matters short by putting the letter directly in her hand, I crossed the street to her side. As soon as we were face to face, I said, How fortunate I am to meet you. Here is the amount you need sealed up in this letter. You see, I had it all ready. The face she lifted to mine wore so blank a look that I paused astonished. "'What do you mean?' she asked, her eyes looking straight into mine with such innocence in their clear blue depths. I was at once convinced she knew nothing of the matter with which my thoughts were busy. "'I am very glad to see you, but I do not in the least understand what you mean by the amount I need.' And she glanced at the letter I held out with an air of distrust mingled with curiosity." I could not explain myself. If she had been made the victim of a conspiracy to procure money from me, it would not help to preserve that sweet innocence of hers to know it. So, with a laugh, I put the letter in my pocket, saying, You cut me short in my efforts to do a charitable action. I heard, no matter how, 
that you were interested just now in a destitute family and took this way of assisting you in their behalf her blue eyes opened wider the poor are always with us she replied but i know of no special family just now that requires any such help as you intimate if i did papa would give me what assistance i needed i was greatly pleased to hear her say this for i am very fond of my young friend but i was deeply indignant also against the unknown person who had taken advantage of my regard for this young girl to force money from me i therefore did not linger at her side but after due apologies hastened immediately here where there is a man employed who to my knowledge had once been a trusted member of the police telling him no more of the story than was necessary to ensure his cooperation in the plan i had formed to discover the author of this fraud i extracted the banknotes from the letter i had written and put in their place stiff pieces of manila paper taking the envelope so filled to the hotel already alluded to i placed it at the opening chapters of isaiah in the bible as described there was no one in either of the rooms when i went in and i encountered only a bellboy as i came out but at the door i ran against a young man whom i strictly forbore to recognize but whom i knew to be my improvised detective coming to take his stand in some place where he could watch the parlor and note who went into it at noon i returned to the hotel passed immediately to the small parlor and looked into the bible the letter was gone coming out of the room i was at once joined by my detective has the letter been taken he eagerly inquired i nodded his brows wrinkled and he looked both troubled and perplexed i don't understand it he remarked i've seen every one who has gone into that room since you left it but i do not know now any more than before who took the letter you see he continued as i looked at him sharply i had to remain out here if i had gone even into the large room the bible would not have been disturbed nor the letter either so in the hope of knowing the rogue at sight i strolled about this hall and kept my eye constantly on that door but he looked embarrassed and stopped you say the letter is gone he suggested after a moment yes i returned he shook his head nobody went into that room or came out of it he went on whom you would have wished me to follow i should have thought myself losing time if i had taken one step after any one of them but who did go into that room i urged impatient at his perplexity only three persons this morning he returned you know them all and he mentioned first mrs Cooldock, taylor who was lending me the superficial attention of a preoccupied man smiled frankly at the utterance of this name of course she had nothing to do with such a debasing piece of business he observed of course not i repeated nor does it seem likely that miss dawes could have been concerned in it either yet my detective told me that she was the next person who went into the parlor i do not know miss dawes so well remarked taylor carelessly but i do said i and i would as soon suspect my sister of a dishonorable act as this noble self-sacrificing woman the third person suggested taylor i got up and crossed the floor when my back was to him i said quietly was mrs walworth the silence that followed was very painful i did not dare to break it and he doubtless found himself unable to do so it must have been five minutes before either of us spoke then he suddenly cried where is that detective as you call him i want to see him let me see him for you said i i should hardly wish sadly discreet as i consider him to know you had any interest in this affair taylor rose and came to where i stood you believe said he that she the woman i am about to marry is the one who wrote you that infamous letter i faced him quite frankly 
I do not feel ready to acknowledge that, I replied. One of those three women took my letter from out the Bible where I placed it. Which of them wrote the lines that provoked it, I do not dare conjecture. You say it was not Mrs. Cooldock. I say it was not Miss Dawes, but... He broke in upon me impetuously. Have you the letter? he asked. I had, and showed it to him. It is not Helen's handwriting, he said. Nor is it that of Mrs. Cooldock or Miss Dawes. He looked at me for a moment in a wild sort of way. You think she got someone to write it for her? he cried. Helen? My Helen? But it is not so. It cannot be so. Why, Huntley, to have sent such a letter as that over the name of an innocent young girl who but for the happy chance of your meeting her as you did might never have had the opportunity of writing herself in your estimation argues a cold and calculating selfishness closely allied to depravity and my helen is an angel oh so i have always thought her the depth to which his voice sank in the last sentence showed that for all his seeming confidence, he was not without his doubts. I began to feel very uncomfortable, and not knowing what consolation to offer, I ventured upon the suggestion that he should see Mrs. Walworth, and frankly ask her whether she had been to the hotel on Main Street on such a day, and if so, if she had seen a letter addressed to Miss N. lying on the table of the small parlour. His answer showed how much his confidence in her had been shaken. A woman who, for the sake of paying some unworthy debt, or of gratifying some whim of feminine vanity, could make use of a young girl's signature to obtain money, would not hesitate at any denial. She would not even blanch at my questions. He was right. I must be convinced in some other way he went on. Mrs. Cooldock or Miss Dawes, do not either of them possess any more truthful or ingenious countenance than she does, and though it seems madness to suspect such women... Wait, I broke in. Let us be sure of all the facts before we go on. You lie down here and close your eyes. Now pull the rug up so. I will have Sudley in and question him. If you do not turn toward the light, he will not know who you are. Taylor followed my suggestion, and in a few moments Sadly stood before me. I opened upon him quite carelessly. Sadly, said I, throwing down the newspaper I had been ostensibly reading. You remember that little business you did for me in Main Street last month? Something I've been reading made me think of it again. Yes, sir. Have you never had a conviction yourself as to which of the three ladies you saw go into the parlour took the letter I left hid in the Bible? No, sir. You see, I could not. All of them are well known in society here, and all of them belong to the most respectable families. I wouldn't dare to choose between them, sir. Certainly not, I rejoined, unless you had some good reason for doing so, such as having been able to account for the visits of two of the ladies to the hotel and not of the third. They all had good pretexts for being there. Mrs. Cooldock gave her card to the boy before going into the parlour and left as soon as he returned with word that the lady she called to see was not in. Miss Dawes gave no card but asked for a Miss Terhune. I think, and did not remain a moment after she was informed that that lady had left the hotel. And Mrs. Walworth? She came in from the street, adjusting her veil, and upon looking around for a mirror, was directed to the parlour, into which she at once stepped. She remained there but a moment, and when she came out, passed directly into the street. These words disconcerted me. The mirror was just over the table in the small room, but I managed to remark nonchalantly, Could you not tell whether any of these ladies opened the Bible? Not without seeming intrusive. 
I sighed and dismissed the man. When he was gone, I approached Taylor. "'He can give us no assistance,' I cried. My friend was already on his feet, looking very miserable. "'I know of but one thing to do,' he remarked. "'Tomorrow I shall call upon Mrs. Coultock and Miss Dawes and entreat them to tell me if, for any reason, they undertook to deliver a letter mysteriously left in the Bible of the blank hotel one day last month. They may have been deputed to do so and be quite willing to acknowledge it.' and mrs walworth will you not ask her the same question he shook his head and turned away very well i said to myself then i will end of section twenty seven Section 28 of Eleven Possible Cases by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Shall He Marry Her? By Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 2. Accordingly, the next day I called upon Mrs. Walworth. She lived, as I already knew, in a small and unpretentious house just on the verge of our most fashionable quarter. But there was great taste displayed in the furnishing of that house, and I was not at all surprised to see evidences here and there of a poverty which the general effect tended to make you forget. I was fortunate enough to find her in, and still more fortunate to find her alone, but my courage fell as I confronted her, for she has one of those appealing faces that equally interest and baffle you, making you feel that unless your errand be one of peace and comfort, you had better not confront so tremulous a mouth and so tender a hazel eye. But I had steeled myself against too much sympathy when I entered her presence so barely pausing to make my most ingratiating bow i took her by the hand and gently forcing her to stand for a moment where the light from the one window fell full upon her face i said you must pardon my intrusion upon you at a time when you are naturally busy but there is something you can do for me that will rid me of a great anxiety you remember being in blank hotel one morning last month she was looking quietly up at me, her lips parted, her eyes smiling and expectant, but at the mention of that hotel I thought, and yet I may have been mistaken, that a slight change took place in her expression, if it was only that the glance grew more gentle and the smile more marked. But her voice when she answered was the same as that with which she had uttered her greeting i do not remember she replied yet i may have been there i go to so many places why do you ask she inquired because if you were there on that morning and i have been told you were you may be able to solve a question that is greatly perplexing me still the same gentle inquiring look on her face only now there was a little furrow of wonder or interest between the eyes I had business in that hotel on that morning, I continued. I had left a letter for a young friend of mine in the Bible that lies on the small table of the inner parlour, and as she never received it, I have been driven into making all kinds of inquiries in hope of finding some explanation of the fact. As you were there at the time, you may have seen something that would aid me. Is it not possible, Mrs. Woolworth? Her smile, which had faded, reappeared on the lips which taylor so much admired a little pout became visible and she looked quite enchanting i do not even remember being at that hotel at all she protested did mr taylor say i was there she inquired with just that added look of inquisitive naivete which the utterance of a lover's name should call up on the face of a prospective bride no I answered gravely, Mr. Taylor unhappily was not with you that morning. She looked startled. Unhappily, she repeated, 
what do you mean by that word and she drew back looking very much displeased i had expected this and so was not thrown off my guard i mean i proceeded calmly that if you had had such a companion with you on that morning i should now be able to put my question to him instead of taking up your time and interrupting your affairs by my importunities she lost her look of anger and acquired one of doubt did she survey me so closely because she was anxious to know if i had compromised her in the eyes of her intended husband or was her expression merely that natural to innocence equally startled and perplexed i could not determine you will tell me just what you mean said she earnestly i was equally emphatic in my reply that is only just you ought to know why i trouble you with this matter it is because this letter of which i speak was taken from its hiding-place by some one who went into the hotel parlour between the hours of half-past ten and twelve and to my certain knowledge only three persons crossed its threshold on that especial morning at that especial time i naturally appeal to each of them in turn for an answer to the problem that is troubling me you know miss n seeing by accident a letter addressed to her lying in a bible in a strange hotel you might think it your duty to take it out and carry it to her if you did and if you lost it but i didn't she interrupted warmly i know nothing about any such letter and if you had not declared so positively that i was in that hotel on that especial day i should be tempted to deny that too for i have no recollection of going there last month not for the purpose of rearranging a veil that had been blown off oh she said but as one who recalls a forgotten fact not as one who is tripped up in an evasion i began to think her innocent and lost some of the gloom which had been oppressing me you remember now said i oh yes i remember that her manner so completely declared that her acknowledgments stopped there i saw it would be useless to venture further if she were innocent she could not tell me more if she were guilty she would not so feeling that the inclination of my belief was in favour of the former hypothesis i again took her hand and said i see that you can give me no help i am sorry for the whole happiness of a man and perhaps that of a woman also depends upon the discovery as to who took the letter from out the bible where i had hidden it on that unfortunate morning and making her another low bow i was about to take my departure when she grasped me impulsively by the arm what man she whispered in a lower tone still what woman i turned and looked at her great heaven thought i can such a face hide a selfish and intriguing heart and in a flash i summoned up in comparison before me the plain honest and reliable countenance of mrs Cooldock, and that of the comely and unpretending miss dawes and knew not what to think you do not mean yourself she continued as she met my look of distress no i returned happily for me my welfare is not bound up in the honour of any woman and leaving that shaft to work its way into her heart if that heart was vulnerable i took my leave more troubled and less decided than when i entered for her manner had been absolutely that of a woman surprised by insinuations she was too innocent to rate at their real importance and yet if she did not take away that letter who did mrs Cooldock? impossible miss dawes the thought was untenable even for an instant i waited in great depression of spirits for the call which i knew taylor would not fail to make me that evening when he came i saw what the result of my revelations was likely to be as plainly as i see it now he had conversed frankly 
with mrs kuldock and with miss dawes and was perfectly convinced as to the utter ignorance of them both in regard to the whole affair in consequence mrs walworth was guilty in his estimation and being held guilty could be no wife for him much as he had loved her and urgent as may have been the causes for her act but said i in some horror of the consequences of an interference for which i was almost ready to blame myself now mrs Kuldock and miss dawes could have done no more than deny all knowledge of this letter now mrs walworth does that and you have seen her you have asked her yes i have seen her and i have asked her and not an eyelash drooped as she affirmed a complete ignorance of the whole affair taylor's head fell i told you how that would be he murmured at last i cannot feel that it is any proof of her innocence or rather he added i should always have my doubts and mrs Kodok and miss dawes ah he cried rising and turning away there is no question of marriage between either of them and myself i was therefore not astonished when the week went by and no announcement of his wedding appeared but i was troubled and i am troubled still for if mistakes are made in criminal courts and the innocent sometimes through the sheer force of circumstantial evidence are made to suffer for the guilty might it not be that in this latter question of morals mrs walworth has been wronged and that when i played the part of arbitrator in her fate i only succeeded in separating two hearts whose right it was to be made happy it is impossible to tell nor is time likely to solve the riddle must i then forever blame myself or did i only do in this matter what any honest man would have done in my place answer me some one for i do not find my lonely bachelor life in any wise brightened by the doubt and would be grateful to any one who would relieve me of it the end End of section 28 End of 11 possible cases by various